I need to say a heartfelt thanks to so many, and I'm afraid I'm gonna leave somebody out, so if I do, I apologize in advance. But first off, I wanna thank all of y'all for coming, because this conference would not happen had you not been willing to stop what you were doing and uh, invest in the expense of coming here and uh, registering and sitting patiently and listening to all this good teaching. So you've made this very successful for me and I, I thank you so much for doing that. So and, you know, give yourself a hand. And I want to thank my wife because she's kind of been my support when I've doubted if I could do this or if we could pull this off or if I got nervous about something. But uh, she told me to suck it up and be a man. <laughs> so. uh, uh, I'd like to thank Amber for doing heading up the food. I don't think anybody's hungry. You know, if, if it had been me, you'd have had paper plates and napkins and some crackers and cheese cubes. So I think we're fortunate she was involved with this. And all the ladies that helped her, they're, uh, I know I'll forget, Shirley, uh, Nancy, uh, Samara, Mom, Jan, Shir I said Shirley. Uh, if I'm, if I'm forgetting, I, I apologize, but there were, there's been many hands involved in all of this. Uh, and I appreciate uh, all that they did and all the support. Uh, your name tags are courtesy of Brenda. She worked up, her husband's in the hospital, if you don't know. She sat up at the hospital and stuffed your name tags in those pouches for me. So, so she would have a part, so I'm grateful for that. Uh, thank the Richmonds for coming and being here. And the teaching's been <coughs> teaching's been wonderful. I can't say enough about that. Thank you for bringing Hillel and uh, letting him speak with us as well. And uh, well, thank you for bringing Shol Shlomo after the experience we're going to have. So, uh, Yitzhak, thank you for coming. We know you've come from home. You've left everything behind. And Hillel, thank you for being able to come and leave your family and sharing with us your expertise. We're so grateful for that. Again, I, I know I'm missing somebody, and I'm, you know, Brian and Chandler for running the sound, setting that up, Jim for video taping the uh, conference and going to make that available to us. I mean, because of him, we're going to have this for years to come and be able to mull this over. And I'm, I'm going to need it. So thank you, Jim. And was somebody waving at me back there? Okay. Security, yes. Kyle and all the guys that you had taking care of security. I mean, but most of you probably didn't know we had security. And so but if, uh, we hope you didn't. <laughs> Uh, the Sheriff's Department, Police Department knew we were here and uh, they made patrols. Uh, Kyle has connections and uh, Gordon and Forrest and all the boys, Hayden and Colton, Logan. Uh, we, we've been safe. Xander. Xander, yeah. He's, he's been my leg sometime. I've run him to death. So. Uh, Okay, I'll quit being mushy now, but I, I thank you so much uh, for, for y'all being here. It's, it's been an honor for, for me to do this. Just we won't talk about the next one for a few weeks, okay? <laughs> uh, I'm going to let uh, Halal come now, but I, I want to brag on him a little bit. I don't know if I was hoping somebody else would tell this story, but uh, a few years ago, the... The French did an excavation. And I, my apologies to the Blues. This it, it's not meant. But the French did an excavation, and uh, they dug down about uh, 20 meters, and they found some thin copper wire. And they thought, well, about 2,000 years ago, our ancestors had a telephone system. 
And uh, the English, Victor, I'm sorry, if, are you in here? No, okay. Uh, the English uh, dug down about 40 meters, and they found, found some what looked like fiber optics. Pay no attention to the map. Okay. The curve. Yeah. <laughs> they found what looked like some thin fiber optics. And so they claimed that about 3,000 years ago, their ancestors had a fiber optic network system. And not to be outdone, Hillel and his team dug and dug and dug, and they got down to about 50 meters. Hillel was down there digging. He came up out of the hole just grinning from ear to ear and so excited. And everybody said, What'd you find? What'd you find? He said, Nothing. They said, well, what are you so excited about? He said, we went down there and we found nothing. That means, ha, <laughs> somebody always does that to me. <laughs> but 3,000 years ago, our ancestors had a wireless system. <laughs> I'm glad this man's my friend. Uh, it's even more special that he's a rabbi's son. And uh, I want to give him the opportunity now to come and uh, share with us about the Temple Mount Sifting Project. Several years ago, <laughs> I got out of the Israeli military. And I was looking for a job for a short time. So I took a job with uh, AOL. Are you familiar? America Online. In retention. It lasted a month. Uh, the month, the course, the course was actually a month, and then I had my first night where I had to take calls from the U.S. And I got three hang-ups that night, so I figured I'll try something else. So my old, my older brother was um, working in this something he called a dig, and he said, "Why don't you come try it?" So I. Uh, I came in thinking I'll be there for a few weeks, and that was 12 years ago. Uh, I kind of got stuck there. I raised up in the ranks, and now I supervise the work there three times uh, a week. And uh, other time, uh, the, the other two days I do research in the lab. So we're going to be talking about this project that I'm involved with, and it is the Temple Mound Sifting Project. Um, I think I prepared a little... PowerPoint here, did I? Yeah. So Jerusalem is the heart of the world, and the Temple Mount is the heart of Jerusalem, and it is the soul, spirit, and heart of the Jewish people. Uh, the Temple Mount is known in the Tanakh as Mount Zion. I think there are two locations where we already hear the term Harabait in the Tanakh, in the, uh, the, fr the first one is in the, prop in the prophet Isaiah, if I'm not mistaken. Somebody will have to look. But I remember the one in the prophet Micah, when he uh, prophesied that the Temple Mount will be desolate. Um, so Mount Zion today is uh, on, in the western hill, and that's a mistaken name. The name migrated from the Temple Mount to, mine, to today's Mount Zion in the late 4th century when a new uh, monastery was built there, uh, the Holy Zion Monastery, if, you, if you're familiar. There's another uh, name for the Temple Mount, which is mentioned only once, and that is Mount Moriah. And that's in Second Chronicles, uh, when King Solomon built uh, the temple upon, upon Mount Moriah. There's uh, and one other mention of Moriah, and that is the land of Moriah in the story of the binding of Isaac. And of course, that takes place on the Temple Mount as well. Uh -huh. Well, the Temple Mount is also... Um, the foundation stone is the very foundation of the universe, and uh, that's where it all began. The Temple Mount today 
is a flat platform. Uh, if you've ever been to the Western Wall or to the Temple Mount, you'll note that you descend to the Temple Mount. Uh, Jaffa Gate is about 777 meters uh, above sea level. Uh, the, old si the Jewish Court is about 750 meters above uh, sea level, while the Temple Mount is 740 uh, uh, meters above sea level. So where is the mountain? Can anybody help me? Underneath. Yes, that's, a, that's the correct answer. Uh, the platform that we know of today is, like we mentioned Thursday night, is due to Herodian uh, expansion of the mount. He basically took the mountain and made it into a platform. You might have uh, visited the site Herodian where he took a platform and made it into a mountain. That was King Herod. Uh, if you go to the bottom of the city of David, you have a climb of about more, th more than 100 meters to the foot of the, tem of the Temple Mount, and believe me, you'll feel the mountain. Try it one day. Uh, the original city of Jerusalem, by the way, the old city of Jerusalem today is not the old city of Jerusalem. There are a lot of wrong names that we're going to be uh, hearing tonight. The old city of Jerusalem is the city of David. The south, oops, sorry about that. The southeastern ridge uh, of Jerusalem, that's where Jerusalem came to be, and that is for a very simple reason, I'm sure you all know. Water. The Gihon Spring is located in, uh, on the southeastern ridge and in the Middle East. We don't have a lot of water, so where there's water, there's life, and that's where the city sprung up to be. During the first temple period, wait, no, before that, yeah, so that's, that's just a depiction of the way the city of David looked during the first temple period. I don't know why I put that slide there. I must have been confused. Well, originally, King David conquered Jerusalem from the Jebusites about 3,000 years ago uh, and built a citadel called the City of David which today the whole city of David is mistaken for that citadel, but the city of David is really called Jerusalem. Uh, the peak of Jerusalem is Mount Zion, Mount Moriah, Temple Mount. King David, of course, did not build a temple, but he did purchase the site from uh, the Jebusite leader Alvona and built an altar to the Lord. What am I looking here? Yeah. So King Solomon, his son, of course, built a temple uh, about 3,000 years ago, a little bit less, in the year 956 BCE, 960 BCE, according to another calculation. And here the, the Temple Mount was incorporated into Jerusalem. Jerusalem continued and incorporated uh, the Temple Mount. And uh, King Solomon built the Temple Mount seven years, and his palace, was it 13? I think it was 13 years. And here we have the first temple period. Uh, the temple was so important to the Jewish people that the entire epoch is named after this building. So we have the first temple period, the second temple period, and I would say so on and so forth, but that was it. Um, but the first temple was the very center of the Israelite kingdom, the united monarchy of King Solomon, until the schism happened, the separation between the kingdom of Israel and the kingdom of Judah, and then it continued to be the center, the spiritual, cultural, religious, whatever you want, center of the, Jewish, of the kingdom of Judah until the destruction in 586 BCE by King Nebuchadnezzar of Babylonia. Okay, so the Jews were, many of them were exiled uh, to Babylonia, and less than 100 years later, they return and build the second temple. Zerubbabel, son, son of Shaltiel, who was the grandson of the penultimate king of Judah, King Yehoiachin, uh, built the temple. But the second temple was 
not as beautiful as the first temple. There were things changed in Judah. There were other parties involved. Uh, and it was a small temple. And there were people, of course, that were alive to see the first temple. And they remembered the first temple. And they were not very happy about the fact that this temple uh, was much smaller. Um, later, uh, during the Hellenistic period, we don't know too much about what was going on then, but uh, the temple was probably a Hellenistic-style temple. Um, and then we have the story of, of the Greeks, um, the Greek king, the evil king, Antiochus IV, who desecrates the temple and leads to the rebellion of the Maccabees, who rededicate the temple and expand the temple mount. This we talked about a little bit. And so the orange expansion is the expansion of the Hashmoneans. This can be seen in the seam in the eastern uh, wall of the temple mount. Later, again, we're not going to get too much into this, but King Herod is the one who builds this flat platform, and the temple mount becomes twice its original size and actually becomes the largest holy enclosure in the ancient world, larger than anything in Rome or Greece. Uh, the reason King Her Herod does this is because, well, first of all, he was a wee bit crazy, <laughs> and he wanted to compete with any Roman leader uh, alive. He wanted to impress the Romans. He wanted to impress the Jews. He was of uh, Edomite origin, and uh, he felt like he, needs to, he needed to impress the Jews so they should like him. And Herod's building, according to Chazal, uh, was the most beautif beautiful building ever built. Whoever did not see King Herod's building never saw a beautiful building in his life. Um, well, so that's Herod's uh, building. This is in the uh, Israel Museum. Uh, there are a few uh, discrepancies in this photo, in this, in this uh, depiction, mainly the fact that the Royal Basilica and the houses in Jerusalem have roof tiles, and this is uh, historical, historically incorrect. The reason this was done this way is that this is before the excavations were uh, permitted, before the, the excavations were permitted after the Six-Day War, and that's why we have these roof tiles, but now we know that the roof tiles begin only in the second century BCE, after the temple was destroyed. That's just a little note. So the second temple was destroyed by the Romans, uh, and again, 2,000 years of exile. And then we have the, uh, basically Jerusalem becomes a Roman pagan city, uh, and the shape of the Temple Mount remains till today. The outline, again, we spoke about this, remains, the, out the outline of Herod's building remains till today. There are courses of stone which are later uh, additions and, and um, repairs, but the outline is Herodian. So in uh, 638, the Muslims uh, conquered Jerusalem and shortly after built the two most famous and well-known structures, the Dome of the Rock, which was built in 691 by Abed, uh, Abdel Malik uh, Ibn Mawani. Uh, this again is not a mosque, this is a shrine which stands upon the uh, summit of Mount Zion, the exposed uh, rocky outcrop, which is the place of the Holy of Holies of the first and second temples. In the southern part of the Temple Mount, they built the Al-Aqsa Mosque. Uh, Al-Aqsa in Arabic means the far away, the distant ma mosque. And this has to do with a, uh, a, a verse, a chapter in the Quran, which talks about Muhammad's night journey. So Muhammad uh, had a night journey um, to a place called Al-Aqsa, to the faraway mosque. And he uh, ascended to heaven and received the, far, the five prayers that the Muslims pray uh, every day. Now, just to make matter, historical matters clear, Al-Aqsa is not in Jerusalem. It is in Saudi Arabia. Okay? Uh, that's A. B, this, this was just a dream. It is what it is. Uh, so this is based upon a dream, not upon reality. 
it is a very important site to Muslims. It is the third holiest site to Sunni Muslims, not the Shiites, the Sunni Muslims. Um, and uh, the time that it really uh, fell into favor with the Muslims was during the Umayyad period, during the uh, late, late 7th, early 8th century CE. Uh, there was a rebellion in Mecca. The, um, what was his name? Abdallah ibn Zubair. He was the leader of Mecca, and he decided to not allow the uh, Arabs of, uh, in, in Syria and, and, uh, and uh, Israel to come to the Hajj in Mecca. He decided not to allow them to come to the Hajj in Mecca because they were uh, rascals. They were not behaving properly. So in order to give a, uh, in order to give a, um, a, re a replacement for Mecca, they decided this is Al-Aqsa. This is Al-Aqsa, and ever since then, uh, that became Al-Aqsa. Nobody knew this? Okay, good thing there are no... Okay, so that's, that's how the story goes. That's how the story goes. So Al-Aqsa was in Saudi Arabia. There was a, uh, Muhammad used to take a journey from Mecca to Medina in Saudi Arabia. And this journey took a few days. I'm oh, sorry, I'm, I'm mixing things up here. But there was, a certain, there was a certain city that he used to travel to. And the, the traveling was overnight. And he had to stop at another uh, town and stay there overnight. And this town had two mosques. It had a close mosque and it had a faraway mosque. Okay, so that's how the story goes, and that's all in Saudi Arabia, but that's not the topic of this talk. So the Al-Aqsa Mosque was built in the, in the southern part of the Temple Mount, where the royal basilica uh, of, of King Herod the Great stood. And like we said, the Dome of the Rock uh, was built upon uh, the Holy of Holies, and we talked about why. Uh, we're going to fast forward now. 1967. Israel uh, retakes the Temple Mount in Jerusalem. And um, for various, makes a bunch of mistakes and allows the Muslims to uh, continue uh, being the sovereign at least as far as the civil administra administration uh, is concerned, being in charge of the Temple Mount. Uh, this situation uh, you might have heard of is called the status quo, which basically means that Jews are not allowed to pray in the Temple Mount. As you can see, uh, Jews are guarded from uttering a word, um, and that is the status quo. Um, in the early 90s, we had the Oslo Peace Accords, Peace Agreement. They want you to remember it like this, but we remember it like this. And <clears throat> part of these talks were talking, of course, about the center of the problem, which is Jerusalem. And the center of the problem is actually the Temple Mount. <clears throat> so uh, in one of uh, Bill Jefferson Clinton's think tanks came up with an idea to have a horizontal, uh, a horizontal plan in which whatever is underneath the Temple Mount will be given to the Jews, to Israel, and whatever is on top will belong to the Palestinians since their shrines are already there and have been there for about a thousand years. Well, uh, like my uh, professor Gabi Barkai says, this is an ingenious idea. But when you come back to Earth, it is idiotic. <laughs> you can't have a country on one, on one level and it's plumbing in, the, in another country. So like we said, the under, the under, uh, underneath the Temple Mount, there are many underground uh, cavities and cisterns. And there was, those were supposed to be given to the Jews. Uh, in the late 90s, as because of this, the Muslims on the Temple Mount decided to 
make some changes to the status quo. Uh, they were going to prevent any possibility of the subterranean areas of the Temple Mount being given to uh, Israel. So they, the first thing they did, or one of the first things, uh, was to declare um, the Cholda Gates a mosque. So the Cholda Gates was declared a mosque. Again, we mentioned that this is the old, oldest second temple uh, uh, structure still standing with Herodian masonry uh, in mint condition. Not anymore, but... So they turned this into a mosque. Um, and the next thing was to take a structure, which you probably heard of, called Solomon Stables. Have you heard of that structure? Well, when again, as far as names are, cons uh, are concerned, it wasn't built by King Solomon, and he didn't use it as stables, but the name is okay. Uh, they decided to take this structure and turn it into a mosque as well. Uh, this structure, its foundations are in the southern, the southeastern part of the Temple Mount, which again, this is where the royal stoa stood. But the structure as of today is later. It is a later structure. Uh, you can see it marked in red. Uh, and it dates to the early Islamic period as far as it looks right now. In this structure, we can see some uh, st Herodian stones in secondary use. Okay, you see those Herodian stones in secondary use. Beautiful Herodian masonry, uh, which again shows us uh, that this, this structure was uh, where, the, where, where the stoa stood. So this is how it looks underneath uh, the ground, underneath the, the uh, Temple Mount. It is a very large hall supported with arches. Um, now, the name Solomon Stables, does anybody know where this name came from? Good answer, 10 points. Okay. So the Crusaders... Uh, conquered Jerusalem in 1099 in a very violent uh, bloodbath, killing both Jews and Muslims, um, and, and initially established their stronghold in the temple on the Temple Mount, and that's where they, the first king, the Crusader Kingdom leaders, uh, that's, the area, that's the structure that they uh, first used in Jerusalem before moving to the Tower of David. But the... <coughs> Crusaders came to the Temple Mount and modified the structures, changed their names to, uh, according to their own beliefs. So the Dome of the Rock became a church. The church was called the Templum Domini, the Temple of the Lord. The crescent was removed. A large golden cross was put up instead. The, uh, the El Aqsa Mosque was named Templum Sulmonis, Solomon's Temple, and the underground structure uh, Stablum Solomonis, the stables of Solomon. Now, the Knights Templar actually did use the structure for their horses. Um, there was a uh, Knights Templar, of course. This is again from my professor, Gabi Barkay, but he says Dan Brown didn't invent this term. Uh, this was a real organization of knights uh, which were established in order to protect the uh, uh, pilgrims that would come to Jerusalem later became a very, very, uh, very, very large force of thousands of knights, and uh, it ended in Black Friday, which, com which is coming soon. Uh, <clears throat> anyhow, so like we said, they did use the structure as horses. We know this to be historically correct. We have historical sources, and plus we have stones with, a, with a, uh, holes in them in order to allow a uh, tying of a beast of burden uh, to, the, uh, to the stones. Uh, after the Crusaders were kicked out by Saladin, um, the structure was filled up and was not in use. Uh, we think this is because the uh, Muslims saw this place as being desecrated by beasts of burden and they did not want to use the place. But uh, as part of this uh, preparation for 
preventing any uh, any any uh, agreement between the Jews and the Palestinians as far as the Temple Mount is concerned. They took this underground structure, uh, which this is how it looked, and started to illegally uh, turn it into a mosque, another mosque. Now this is a very, very lar large area which can hold uh, upwards of 10, maybe 15,000 people at once. And the work was done completely illegally um, without, uh, without uh, paying dues to any uh, munis municipal laws or even more important archaeological laws. They cleaned it out, they lowered the floor levels, put in new pavement, put in new carpeting uh, and lighting system. And the mosque became known as El Mawani Mosque. Again, Mawan was the father of Abdel Malik who built the Dome of the Rock. <coughs> but uh, we don't know exactly what damage was caused, but obviously damage was caused to antiquities. But the main damage was done three years later. They received some sort of ambiguous permission uh, to open up a, quote, emergency exit. And what happened next was the worst archaeological crime ever committed in Jerusalem in modern times, as far as we know of. And that is digging a pit uh, just north of Salomon Stables, 12 meters down and 40 meters long, using heavy machinery. So tractors, bulldozers, and so on and so forth, and removing about 9,000 tons of uh, earth saturated with archaeological, uh, the ar archaeological history of the Temple Mount. Um, this picture was taken by the Israeli police, uh, who did not was wasn't there to prevent it uh and, it, and eventually the work was stopped after a number of days, but the damage was irreversible um, What ended up happening instead of an emergency exit is this became the main entrance to the structure, and a monumental staircase was built leading down to the structure. The earth that was removed was treated as garbage and dumped in various junkyards uh, in the area of Jerusalem, uh, some outs right outside Jerusalem and some very close to the Temple Mount in the Kidron Valley, the, uh, western, the western slope uh, of the Kidron Valley. This is a photo of the debris that was removed from the Temple Mount. Here we have a, a short video, but I don't think we have time to show it. As far as the archaeological damage that uh, was done, um, we have on the uh, eastern side of the Temple Mount, we can see several layers of, uh, of architecture, the top being um, probably Ottoman, and the two lower ones are early Islamic. But we also see some other elements there. Uh, this was documented by uh, a number of archaeologists from the Israel Antiquities Authority, but we don't know the exact extent of the damage. Now, here again, we're looking at we're looking at the ver various phases of the Temple Mount, and this is from Lean Rittmeyer. You can see on the bottom the pit, and you can see that the pit is in the area of the Hashmonean expansion, and goes into the 500 by 500 cubit uh, area of the Temple Mount, but doesn't go deep enough. If it would have gone a little deeper, they might have exposed uh, the Temple Mount from the first Temple period. But again, we don't know exactly uh, what the damage was. So this material represents architecture, but it, al it also represents fills. Fills, uh, during the Crusader period, this was... Uh, hollowed out. It wasn't filled up like it was prior to the destruction. And probably the whole eastern side of the Temple Mount was lower. It was lower than the rest of the Temple Mount, such as is by the Golden Gate, Shah al Khamim, which is lower than the rest of the Temple Mount. This, uh, this, I think, is also mentioned in the Mishnah, that the priest 
uh, when preparing the red heifer has to be able to see the opening of the sanctuary from the Mount of Olives, and that's maybe one of the reasons that the Temple Mount was lower on the eastern side when he, he was standing on the Mount of Olives, which is east of the Temple Mount. Uh, so this material represents accumulation from inside the Temple Mount, which accumulated just north of Solomon's stables where the pit was dug. So part of this accumulation might be purposeful, but a lot of it is just debris from around the Temple Mount that was dumped in its lowest place, which was there. So archaeologically, this represents something which we call a survey. So in archaeology, uh, there are two main methods. One is survey, the other is excavation. Excavation gives you a very precise picture of a certain location, and a survey gives you a wide picture of a, of a wider area and gives you an overview. So that's uh, the way we see this archaeologically. We see this as a um, penetrative uh, survey, which is better than a regular survey because there was an excavation done here. Now, Jerusalem, other than being, uh, sorry, the Temple Mount, other than being a very holy site, is also an archaeological site. Uh, and one of the most important in the world, if not the most important in the world. Jerusalem, when I say Jerusalem, I mean the rest of Jerusalem, the city of David primarily, has 150 years of excavations, history of excavations, uh, among them performed by the pioneers of archaeology, British, French, German archaeologists who came here, uh, but the Temple Mount has been off limits. When the British came here, uh, Sir Charles Warren and, uh, and uh, Charles Wilson, they initially wanted to go straight to the point and excavate the Temple Mount, but they weren't allowed to. So Charles Warren dug a bunch of uh, holes surrounding the Temple Mount, uh, and we have a lot of information for that, from that, and we owe a lot to his work till today. And uh, Charles Wilson made the first a mapping of the Temple Mount, and all the cisterns and all the rest of the uh, information we have are still valid till today, basically. But if we look at a map of Jerusalem, we can see all the red spots that you see are excavated areas, and the Temple Mount is a black hole, a white hole. But we have no proper archaeological understanding of the material culture of the Temple Mount. So when this damage is done, it makes it even worse because any information uh, which we could have we could, we, could, we could have obtained by properly excavating is completely lost forever. Well, two young archaeology students to the rescue. <coughs> uh, the guy in the left is Tzachi uh, Dvira. And the guy on the right is Aran Yardeni. They were <coughs> young archaeology students at the time, studying in Barilan under Professor Gavi Barkai. Well, they went looking through the debris and found a bunch of artifacts dating to various periods. The guy on the left was arrested by the Israeli police for antiquity theft. <coughs> what's, the, what's the line? Still a little and they, and they throw you in jail, still a lot and they make you ki king? So. So here's the pictures of uh, the archaeologists looking through the <coughs> debris. And they brought some of, this, some of these artifacts to their professor, Gabi Barkai. Gabi Barkai is a world-renowned archaeologist, biblical archaeologist. He found the famous Birkat uh, Kohanim, uh, the priestly blessing, uh, in, a, in a burial cave in Jerusalem. This is the, early, the earliest verse from the Bible we know of. Uh, hundreds of years earlier than the Dead Sea Scrolls. <clears throat> this was in a little, uh, a little uh, amulet of silver. So I know that's what he's mostly famous for, but they took this to his house. They took the artifacts to his house, and he was appalled to see uh, pieces of pottery from the first temple period rolling in the dirt. Uh, pieces of pottery from the 8th century BCE, time of King Hezekiah. Uh, and Prophet Isaiah. Uh, this 
hit the news, and there was an outcry, but the damage was done. There was even a uh, petition by all spectrums of the uh, Israeli um, uh, cultural uh, sects, various artists and writer, uh, artist, uh, artists and, uh, and uh, authors and so on and so forth, all wrote this petition calling for the government to do something about this destruction. Uh, <clears throat> okay, I'm not going to get into this. It's a little too technical. The archaeologist uh, we just talked about eventually got permission to get hold of this material and to try to obtain any information they can from this material. This is a map of the dumps in the Kidon Valley. The, ma the dumps were mapped uh, to try to later understand their significance. And with the help of the, the Israel Parks Department, were brought to a very near park, which is a two-minute drive from the area where they were dumped, called Emek Tzurim. So here we see them <coughs> preparing the material in the Kidon Valley, mapping it, and here's Emek Tzurim. Few, a few of you have been there already, right? Uh, this is a, a national park which uh, basically uh, aims to, first of all, prevent, prevent illegal building, which is a very serious problem in East Jerusalem, but also to, um, to preserve the, the biblical landscape of Jerusalem. You can see the Temple Mount in the foreground. Is that the proper word? The material is brought to Emek Tzurim. Um, over 100 trucks uh, were brought. I think over 200 trucks were brought uh, and covered in plastic to preserve them. And slowly, slowly, this project started uh, becoming uh, larger. Uh, and today, uh, it is a very large project. It is probably one of the, the largest archaeological projects as far as uh, participants uh, who took part in the, in the project. I think over 200,000 people took part. Uh, and it is, it was uh, the, for the, the sec from the second year, from the second season, uh, was under the auspices of bar -Ilan University, uh, it was financed by the City of David Foundation, and of course was inside the, the National Park, so we owe them thanks as well. The methods that we had to come up with were, we had to uh, kind of figure things out. So the way we decided to go through, th through this material is to first of all do what we do in archaeology, which is called dry sifting. Basically running it through a sifter, shaking it out, trying to, uh, trying to identify, identify any artifacts. But in this case, this is not enough, so we spray it with water. And once you spray it with water, all the artifacts start showing up. And every single bucket has artifacts in it. Every single bucket. Uh, and like I said, this became, other than archaeological project, it became a very important um, um, community project, um, educational project, uh, and so on and so forth, with people from all over the world uh, coming and helping. Um, soldiers, tourists, people from China, people from the US, people from all over. You might recognize some of them sitting beside you. <laughs> <laughs> Weren't expecting that, were you? Well, the method is that people come and collect six categories. They, coll they collect anything that's man-made or may pertain to human activities. So we find pottery, bones, uh, mosaics, glass, and metal, and special stones. These are the generic finds that everybody finds. And later, these are sorted, and uh, we, sh we try and make sense of the things. Now what I'm going to do is I want to show you some artifacts that have been found in the project. This is pottery. Pottery is the bread and butter of, of archaeological dating. Uh, this is how we can tell time. 
What you see here is pottery from the Bronze Age. So this is when Israel was not called Israel. It was called the land of Canaan. And this is from the second millennium BCE, meaning three and a half to 4,000 years ago. Uh, on, your right, you, on the right, you see a juglet, the base of a juglet. On your left, you see a painted shirt in the uh, chocolate and white uh, style. And in the bottom, you see a typical late bronze cooking pot. From the late bronze period, a, quite an enigmatic period uh, in, in the land of Israel, we have Egyptian style and Egyptian influenced artifacts. We have here to the right scarabs, which are uh, inspired by the dung beetle who the Egyptians, Egyptians uh, saw as holy. To the left we have a jar handle with a scarab impression. On the bottom we have an amulet uh, dating to the 19th dynasty. Another interesting artifact is this finger, which looks like it's part of a statue, an Egyptian statue. Um, it's very interesting because there are several Egyptian artifacts and in Jerusalem, and slowly, slowly, it's starting to look like there was some sort of maybe Egyptian temple, not far from the Temple Mount in the area of today's Damascus Gate, uh, about 3,200 years, years ago. This was fe featured in uh, Biblical Archaeology Review uh, not too long ago. We have uh, artifacts from the first temple period. Sorry. Most importantly, pottery. Pottery tells us when a site was, uh, was in use. Uh, so here are some drawings of pottery. And we have pottery from the Iron 2A which is roughly 10th century BCE, time of King Solomon. So that's very important. We have marked handles. Um, these handles are, have various markings on them. Some of them, according to certain researchers, might have to do with the tumot to the temple because they are found in very large numbers in Jerusalem. These are uh, shards of pottery with uh, sections of inscriptions on them. These inscriptions were usually uh, done after the vessel was already fired. They didn't have paper back then, so they used what they, what they had. And pottery was readily available. Uh, because of the nature of the destruction, so most artifacts are not well preserved, which is too bad because writing is the most important thing that you could find in archaeology, any kind of inscription. We have scale weights. These weights are, are from the kingdom of Judah, 8th, 7th century BCE. During the first temple period, there were no coins. They, they were not invented yet, so they used precious metals, uh, gold and silver, and they weighed them on a scale. We have some seals. This is a, a seal from the 8th or 7th century BCE. A seal would have had a name on it. This one is worn out. This seal is a very rare seal. It's a conoid shape. It dates to the uh, late Iron One, Iron 2A, meaning give or take King Saul, David, or Solomon. And the, li the little boy that found it was a Russian tourist. And he was very, very excited. And this, w this, hit, the this hit the news. And uh, his parents bought him a suit. And he was featured on... Putin's uh, official Russian propaganda uh, channel. Uh, the seal is anapographic, meaning it has no writing on it. Uh, 3,000 plus years ago, writing was very rare. So it has uh, pictographs on it. It has um, the bottom is some sort of quadruped, and the top is a lion. And it may symbolize a ruler uh, subduing um, the weaker or whatever. Uh, this is probably the most important artifact uh, from the first temple period. And this is a bula. A bula is a seal impression. Uh, I'm sure you saw in the movies when somebody writes a letter, he rolls up a document, puts some wax on it, and then stamps it with his... Uh, signet ring, so this is the same thing, only it was done upon a wet piece of clay. 
uh, the bulla is broken, the seal in Persian is broken, and it originally had three lines. The top line probably depicted an animal of some sort. Uh, the middle line uh, has a first name on it, and the bottom line has the name of the father, or the house of, or what we call today the last name. The characters are in ancient Hebrew. Ancient Hebrew? Who here can read ancient Hebrew? Okay, so uh, I'll read it to you. And what it says is the middle one, the last name is Liyahu. Remind you of any names? Any name from this period basically ended like that. In the kingdom of Judah, Eliyahu, Gealiyahu, Atzaliyahu, and so on and so forth. It is the name of the, of the divinity. But the bottom name is what's important because the bottom name can be read. And the bottom name is Imel. Okay, you already saw the verse. Okay, so Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 1. It is mentioned in several other places, uh, such as Chronicles. It is the number 16 of the Mishmarot The twenty number 16 out of the 24 families who took part in the worship of the temple. Peshchul, son of Imer, was the chief officer of the house of the Lord. The, during the first temple period, it's not called the temple. It's called the house of the Lord. And what we have is direct regards from a priest serving in Solomon's temple. Now this is not Pashul, but one of his kin. Now most, uh, most often the seal impressions, the back of them will uh, indicate what they were attached to, and often they were attached to a book. A book in biblical terms is a rolled up piece of parchment which can be a legal document, a letter, or anything else. And usually, or very often, these seal impressions were for documents. And the, ba the back of them had, uh, had a negative of papyrus, which is a, the kind of paper uh, from a plant which grows in Egypt. But this seal is different. Can you tell what's the, ba what's the back of it? It's fabric. This indicates that it was attached to some sort of sack. Now, this sack may very well have been part of the treasures of the temple itself. Um, here you can see the idea. This is a sack of gold. Uh, this drawing was done by my sister-in-law, Razia. Uh, and you can see where the, uh, where the seal would have been attached. And that's what it probably uh, is from. Here we have uh, broken pieces of figurines or idols. We know that according to Chazal, one of the reasons for the destruction of the first temple period was the worship of idols. And we have them in abundance. And in any excavation in Jerusalem from the Iron Age, from the first temple period, we find many, metal, many, many idols. Weaponry. We have arrowheads. The top one is a very rare arrowhead. It dates, give or take, to the 10th century BCE. So it could have been from one of King Solomon's uh, royal guards, we don't know. The one on the, bo the, one on the bottom is a skito iranian type, which is a Babylonian arrowhead. Uh, it looks like it was made yesterday. And um, this was probably fired uh, from a bow uh, during the destruction of the temple. This was used by, this, by the uh, Babylonian archers. Um, here we have sling stones, which are made of uh, flint. These are well known from other uh, Judean sites, such as Lachish, level 3, uh, which was destroyed by King Sennacherib in the year 701 BCE. And you can see a depiction on the left. If I'm not mistaken, that's actually from the wall in Nineveh, which depicts the siege on Lachish. Uh, it doesn't look like much, but believe me, this is worse than the 45. We have artifacts dating to the Second Temple period. We have uh, many, many coins. So these are coins of the Second Temple period. Among them, the first coin or the first coins ever minted in the land of Israel, and we're talking about mid, sorry, uh, uh, early fourth century BCE, and this is under Persian rule, when Judah was known as Yehud Medinta, or uh, the province of the state of Judah, but it was under 
Persian rule. This is during the time of Ezra and Nehemiah. And these coins are very small. They uh, depict an owl and other, other uh, items. And they basically imitate Greek coins of the time, the drachmot. There are three ancient Hebrew letters on the coin, which is Yahad. Yahad, again, short for Yehud Medinta. And if you take a modern shekel out of your pocket, you can see the same exact three letters commemorating this very coin. Here we have artifacts from the Hellenistic period. So in uh, 169, uh, King Antiochus Epiphanes IV, who was a Greek uh, Syrian king, uh, took over the Temple Mount and desecrated it. And what we have here is a jar handle of an amphora. This is an import vessel, non-local, which was used for importing wine. Uh, these can be dated precisely to a given year because they come from the island of Rhodes. The island of Rhodes was uh, produced very, very good wine. Uh, and the ruler of the, the island of Rhodes was a priest which was replaced every year. So we have the name of the priest. We know when he lived. And in this case, 168 BCE, exactly one year after uh, the Temple Mount became uh, Hellenized. And here we have Yain Nesach, which is not kosher, uh, on the Temple Mount. To the right, you can see a coin of Antiochus Epiphanes IV, who was the evil villain from the Hanukkah story. Here we have an arrowhead from this period, which could have been from the uh, battles of the Maccabees against the Greeks. And to your right, you see a Maccabean coin of Yohanan Hyrcanes I, these were the first coins ever minted under uh, sovereign Jewish rule in the land of Israel. And they have the cornucopia, which is depicted, depicted on the two-shekel coin of today. Uh, later, Second Temple period, we have uh, objects having to do with purity. We have combs uh, for combing one's hair before uh, immersion in the mikvah, and stone vessels. Stone vessels. Pottery vessels, when, uh, when they come in contact with impurities, they have to be broken. And stone vessels never become impure. That's why they were very, very popular in Jerusalem, first among the priestly class, but then they became very popular uh, among the, the rest of the, of the population. And stone vessels uh, continued basically until the Bar Kokhba revolt. Uh, they are a very, very important indicator of, Jew of uh, Jewish uh, settlements, because when you're excavating somewhere outside Jerusalem and you're not sure if it was a Jewish town or not, if you find stone vessels, so it means there was definitely a Jewish population. We have architectural mem members uh, of various structures on the Temple Mount. Some of them perhaps from the very temple itself. So it's not just from the Second Temple period, it's from the Second Temple. Uh, this is a, just a piece that I had on my phone and I thought I would throw it in. It's, I'm holding what looks like an entrance, a, um, a lintel uh, to a structure which is resided. Uh, it's set back, which uh, is also an important uh, thing. The first temple was uh, uh, set back, and there's a, a lot of studies about that. Here we have frescoes, painted plaster in the state-of-the-art Roman uh, styles. This is Herodian. That's me. Uh, what I'm ho what I'm holding on to is a uh, capital, a Doric capital. If you came into the hotel, you noticed similar capitals, but those are relatively modern. Um, and this is a capital which probably uh, came from the eastern wall of the Temple Mount, the eastern portico which we already mentioned is called Solomon's Porch. We know that this portico dates to the Hashmonian period. And this, this column uh, probably came from there. So We have uh, over 100, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Opus Ectila tiles date, dating to the Second Temple period. And these are stones which were elaborately cut in various geometrical shapes. This is a Roman, a state-of-the-art Roman method of making floor patterns. Uh, they were used in Roman palaces and villas. And King Herod uh, brought this to the land of Israel. 
We know this because we have other Herodian sites which have intact Opus Sectile floors, which you can still go and see till today. He used local stones, but he also imported various kinds of beautiful uh, marbles and other stones from Asia Minor, uh, Greece, and he brought them all to the land of Israel. So we have Herodian um, Opus Sectile in various sites. I'm just showing you some examples of Herodian sites. Uh, and we know now that he also had them on the Temple Mount because we find them on the Temple Mount. And here's a quote from Josephus. Those entire courts that were exposed to the sky were laid with stones of all colors and sorts. We also have a, an inscription that was found uh, in the foot of the Temple Mount which talks about a donation made for, uh, for the floors. And this is from... Uh, a Jew from the island of Rhodes. So uh, we were able to actually, uh, using parallels and mathematics, uh, this was done by a woman named Frankie Snyder, who was a uh, mathematician. She was able to actually reconstruct Herod's floors of the Second Temple. So here we have parallels from Masada and from, Cy from uh, Cyprus. Kipos, which is a um, which is a citadel in the uh, uh, Jordan Valley, and here we are from the Temple Mount. You can see uh, we have very good parallels, and we were able to reconstruct. And these are the fl these are the patterns that we were able to reconstruct. They were in the temple courts, in the porticos. We're not sure exactly where, but here's another example of a literary source and archaeological evidence which come together. And here's Frankie Snyder. Um, I took that picture. Um, this is another quote from the Babylonian Talmud, uh, talking about yellow and white marble. Some say of blue, yellow, and white marble. So we see more literary quotes about the floors of the temple that were elaborately decorated. And this is just uh, a an idea of that we had uh, of how the floors may have looked uh, during the Second Temple period. Here we have coins which represent the end of the uh, epoch of the Second Temple period. These are great revolt coins minted by the Jewish rebels who rebelled against Rome. Uh, the top one is from the year 4, and it has the first depiction of the uh, Abat Aminim, the, the, um, brand, the, the etrog and uh, Lulav Harissi, the palm branch. And the bottom is from the year two of the Great Revolt, and it was also one of the first coins ever found in the project. And on it, it says, for the freedom of Zion. Another very important coin that was found was this coin, which is half a shekel. Now, a shekel today is a monetary unit, but a shekel is actually, in biblical times, is a weight measurement. Um, the word shekel actually comes from mishkal, uh, which is weight. And this is a very rare coin, again, minted by the rebels, uh, the Jewish rebels who rebelled against Rome. And they did this as an act of sovereignty, a, an act of freedom, an act of uh, hope. Because up until then, the only silver half shekel, which of course is a bil biblical requirement as a tax to the temple that was paid in the temple, was in U.S. dollars. <coughs> when I say U.S. dollars, I mean the uh, mint of Tyre, the uh, Tyre in Lebanon, which was the only coin that was payable in the temple. It was considered, uh, uh, considered a good coin up until then when they minted their own coins, probably on the Temple Mount itself. One side says on it, uh, Holy Jerusalem, and the other side says on it, half a shekel in ancient Hebrew. These are artifacts from the destruction. Uh, these are Roman arrowheads, uh, three tang, three, three bladed arrowheads. And the bottom one is a, a, from a catapult, which uh, there are very few of these, but the catapult was brought in by Titus himself. This was the first time they brought the catapult in. And that was a weapon 
that would help them to uh, eventually take the take the temple and destroy it. <coughs> These already represent the Roman occupation of Jerusalem. These are roof tiles, which we mentioned earlier, from the 10th Roman legion who destroyed uh, the second temple, Legio Ten Fotensis. And these are, again, small broken pieces. And on the bottom is a picture of how it would have looked. That's not from the Temple Mount. That's a complete one. We have many game pieces, many, many dice, which were used by the Roman uh, soldiers. Uh, very popular. They didn't have phones back then, so they would play the games. And uh, one very interesting dice is a this dice, which has only even numbers. Uh, it's probably a cheater's dice. <laughs> and uh, we, it reminds us of the Mishnah, which gives, uh, gives a list of people who, c who cannot uh, give testimony before a court of law. And one of them is the roller of the dice. Hmm. Uh, this is some sort of object that we're not sure exactly about its date, but I saw a parallel which was dated to the Roman period, so I threw it in there. At first, we thought it was a flintlock from a uh, from a uh, very fancy Ottoman flintlock rifle, but now we think it's a fire starter. Uh, maybe Roman, but we're not sure. This is uh, some sort of one-of-a-kind object, which probably dates to the Roman period as well. We have an uh, intag intaglio. Uh, some of them date to the Roman period. This is a figurine uh, depicting a goat which is also Roman. Uh, we can tell by the workmanship and uh, by the artifact. And it represents the uh, god Pan, which is the god of the meadows and so on and so forth. And actually, it's where the word panica, panica, panic comes from. Um, here we have architectural members from the Byzantine period. Um, according to the common notion, the Byzantine period uh, completely forgot about the Temple Mount and actually, uh, on purpose, uh, left it desolate because it was it, it uh, symbolized the uh, destruction of Jerusalem and that God took away uh, the covenant from the Jews. But lo and behold, we have all kinds of interesting pieces from the Byzantine period, and pieces that cannot be from a garbage dump because you know you can say, oh, it's just garbage that was dumped, but we have many many pieces of mosaics. And mosaics are not dumped. They're reused. It's very hard to make a mosaic. You can sit down and try. You need a lot of patience. And this actually brings us to another, um, another uh, documentation from the British from the late 30s. There are mosaics underneath the Al-Aqsa Mosque. There are mosaics underneath the Al-Aqsa Mosque, which we know uh, are not Islamic. They are deeper in level than the earliest uh, levels of the Al-Aqsa Mosque. And they also have patterns running from east to west, which is according to Byzantine churches. So we also have Opus Sectile from the Byzantine period, these tiles that continued in use. They weren't as elaborate as during the Herodian period, but they, they still continued. Uh, various scale weights from the Byzantine period for measuring precious metals. We have artifacts from the Islamic periods. We have weights from the Islamic periods. We have uh, gold coins and other coins from the Islamic period. These mosaics uh, are from the original structure of the Dome of the Rock, built in 691. They were made of glass, and also some of them were gilded. We have many, many pieces of inlays of mother of pearl, which, which also date to the Islamic periods. These were uh, inlays which were part of the uh, buildings there. And this is an interesting one with an etching of the Dome of the Rock. We're not sure when, when to date this to. But um, here we have um, horseshoe nails uh, of the Crusader period. They are shaped like a fiddle key. And these are European in style, and are probably from the Knights Templar, or from the Crusader horses that were in Solomon's stables, and that's where the material comes from. A large selection of arrowheads of all kinds. 
there's one in here that is uh, an anti-horse arrowhead. Uh, these are silver coins of the Crusader Kingdom of Jerusalem. Uh, we have the largest collection in Jerusalem, um, over a hundred of them. They depict the Templum Domini, which is the Church in the Dome of the Rock, the Tower of David, and the Church of the Holy Sepulchre. And this is a very, very rare coin, Crusader coin, a, a gold coin. Uh, it is cut for its value. Uh, I forget who, who, it, who it is, but it's a very, very rare uh, Crusader coin. We have Oposictira tiles once again, and these date to the Crusader period. And another uh, amazing thing that we were able to do is to reconstruct floors from the church that was uh, in the Dome of the Rock. We did this with exact parallels. Uh, there are stones, you can see the stones that are laid on the parallel. So one of them, actually, Dr. Ron Beals helped a lot with this, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, but we have two patterns. Uh, the one on the left is from uh, the Church of the Holy Sepulchre and the Church of St. John the Baptist. And this one is very interesting because we reverse engineered it from a, a wood cutting from the 19th century. So this is the wood cutting. We weren't sure about the dating. And this is from a book by Charles Wilson, Picturesque Palestine. And we have pictures of the flooring right by the Dome of the Rock. And this is the pattern that we were able to reconstruct. And later, uh, there was a short period where they were fixing the carpets, were changing the carpets, and they lifted up the carpets. And we have photographs of the exact pattern uh, that we reconstructed. And this is in secondary use, but right near the Dome of the Rock. And it was used with new stones as well. We have... Um, Ottoman wall, tile, wall, wall tiles, glazed tiles. These are from the Dome of the Rock uh, itself. You can see them till today, but they uh, underwent several uh, phases of renovation due to earthquakes. These were put up by Sultan Suleiman in the 16th century after the, the or prior mosaics were too weathered. We have uh, many, many seals from the Ottoman period of various Ottoman officials. The one uh, on the bottom is Abdel Fatah el-Tamimi, uh, if I'm not mistaken, from the 1700s, who is the, uh, the, uh, one of the forefathers of today's deputy uh, mufti of Jerusalem, something, something, El Tamimi. I forget the <laughs> Something Azam, El Tamimi. Can you cut that out? Okay. Um, this is a very important artifact because some naysayers or some archaeologist or some jealous archaeologist or whatever say, how do you know that this material is from the Temple Mount? Well, we know because we mapped it. We watched the trucks coming out. Uh, we have various artifacts, just like the ones that I just showed you, the uh, wall tiles, which are from the Temple Mount. But here we have a, uh, a seal of the waqf, a seal of the waqf, which came out of the material. Beautiful bracelets. We have the largest assortment, uh, a variety of bracelets that we know of. These are from the Islamic periods, glass bracelets, glass rings, all kinds of jewelry, which many of it is hard to date because uh, jewelry is pretty similar throughout different periods. These are some, uh, some uh, uh, necklaces that we were able to string with various stones and other beads that we found. We have military insignia from the First World War, um, from the Australian Army, British Army. This is just an assortment. A lot of ammo. Um, one, there are a few, there's a few rare ones, like 38 uh, Russian and things from the 19th century, uh, lead, lead musket balls and various projectiles, uh, British, uh, Lee Enfield, 303, never mind. These are um, uh, and munitions from the Six Day War. Uh, on the right, you see two 50 caliber uh, projectiles which uh, hit their target or hit a, heavy, or hit a hard surface. To the left, you see uh, nine millimeter Uzi submachine gun uh, rounds. Uh, you see a Uzi submachine machine gun clip. 
And to the right, you see a, um, a um, how do you call it when it doesn't have the tip on it? No, it's the case, but it's, it didn't have a projectile. It's to fire a grenade. What's that? No, it's a it's a bullet that doesn't have a it doesn't have a projectile. It just has it just has a black it just has powder in order to fire out a a grenade. Yeah, it's a blink. That's what it's called. So it's a rocket. It's a it's a if it's for firing a uh, a rocket a um, a a grenade which is attached to the uh, to the um, muzzle. Anyway, these are from the Six Day War. The middle one is dated 1952, which is four years after the establishment of the State of Israel, uh, which shows us that they were using um, pretty ancient ammo in 1967, but we know that they emptied the, they emptied the, uh, the ammo and had to take whatever they could. Uh, we have many, many bones, which I didn't get into. Among them, many are burnt. Now, uh, when you cook, you usually don't burn it to this degree unless you're a bad cook. But uh, it could very well be that some of these are from sacrifices. Uh, we also have what's that? offerings. <laughs> <laughs> we also have um, fox bones. We have a few fox. I actually saw one a few weeks ago where I work chasing a dog. No, sorry, the dog was chasing that. Because of the Mount of Zion, which is desolate, the foxes walk upon it. <coughs> and we all know the story of Rabbi Akiva, who saw the fox come out of the Holy of Holies and was crying. And uh, I guess we're also crying, you know, because of the destruction, and we're also happy about the ability to reconstruct and to find these artifacts. And this is the verse that we've used throughout the years in this project. <coughs> For your servants hold her stones dear and have pity on her dust. Thank you very much. <laughs>